Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is mixer Andrew Mori. But first of all, Facebook looks like it's losing teens, at least in the United States. Now, we've heard this before, but now there's some really concrete research that claims that it's true. This is from Pew Research, and they found that 51% of teens between the ages of 13 and 17, their use is down. And it's way down because just a few years ago in 2015, the usage was at 71%. So what are teens using? Well, 85% use YouTube. No surprise there except how high that is. It's a little higher than we would have expected. Instagram sits at 72% and Snapchat at 69%. Now, the research also found that 45% of teens say they're online almost constantly. And, of course, this is because of use of the cell phone. So what are they using most frequently? What social networks? 35% say Snapchat. 32% say YouTube, and only 10% with Facebook. Now, what's interesting is it turns out that there's an income disparity with Facebook. Teens that come from lower-income families, in other words, those making less than 30000 a year, they tend to use Facebook a lot more than if they're from a family making more than that. Now, when it comes to Instagram, however, finds that household wealth doesn't matter at all. So all these things really make a difference. What I found the most interesting in all this, 95% of teenagers own a smartphone. And that's way, way, way higher than I ever would have thought. So Facebook should be looking over their shoulder. This is not really good news. And the reason why, of course, is the next generation of users may not be users at all. If you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. Check out my Hitmakers Club for access to the Private Mixers Facebook group, monthly deconstructed hits, mixing workshop and Q&A webinars, and for a short time, access to my core training module bonus. Go to hitmakersclub.com to learn more. Now let's talk about the creative cycle. When it comes to writing, songwriters have it pretty easy. You sit down and you create, you make something up. And outside the fact of if you're trying to write something that's going to be accepted in pop right now, for the most part, creativity has no bounds. Whatever you feel like writing, you can, and it's acceptable, and there's a good chance that it may be widely acceptable. When it comes to creating for film or television or operas or anything that's long form, a composer definitely has a different outlook and a different way of working. And it's what's known as the creative cycle. The creative cycle basically has three different elements to it. First of all, you have to sit down and plan out your parameters. And of course, this is something that doesn't occur with songwriters. Songwriters sit down and they write, except if they're writing for the top 40. They're writing for a hit. Then there are certain parameters that you have, but they're not nearly as stringent as what a composer might have. So that's the first thing. Plan the parameters. The second thing is actually do it to create. But the third thing is to review. So you basically have to create something. The next day you come back and you review it. And that tells you if you're on the right track or not, have to do a rewrite, have to update something, whatever. Now, I found that this was very similar to my creative method. Something I found for writing that really, really works for me. It's a three-step method. And after I kind of developed it, I found that it works for all creative processes, at least for me. So what's this three-step method? Well, when I first sit down to create, it's completely stream of consciousness. I don't worry about where the periods are, where the paragraphs are, the spelling, none of that. I just let it flow because I know if I begin to edit too soon, I'll miss some ideas, some great ideas. In fact, we'll kind of go into the ether. I'll have them one second and it'll be gone the next in the middle of editing something. So I've learned to just have kind of a brain dump. Whatever I can think of, that's what goes on the page. That's what goes into creating, whatever that creation might be. 
The second step is refinement, and that's when I kind of knock things into shape. So in other words, if I'm writing a blog post or a book chapter or anything like that, at this point, that's kind of where I'll clean up the spelling, and I'll also pound it into shape paragraph-wise, thought-wise, and just make the whole thing make sense. The third phase is what's known as polish. And this has to happen for me on a completely other day. So in other words, if I'm going to do this right, I'm going to create it today and tomorrow I'm going to come back after being refreshed and then polish it up and really take it to the next level. Now, I've also found that sometimes I'll do a fourth and a fifth pass and make it even better so I'll polish it even more. But anything more than that, and I find that I'm just making it different and not better, and it should go to other eyes to actually refine and polish it at that point. So anyway, the creative cycle for composers and my three-step creative method really have a lot in common. But it's something that you should think about the next time you're sitting down to create. That in fact, there are multiple steps in this. Sometimes there are geniuses that just make it easy and they can sit down and do everything in one pass. But for most of the rest of us humans, it takes more than that. My guest this week is record producer, mixing engineer, and songwriter Andrew Morey. Andrew is one of the few mixers who's made the transition from mixing live sound to the studio. And he's had a lot of success, especially lately with big hits by Shawn Mendes. In the interview, we talked about live versus studio mixing, mixing in the box, and his favorite plugins, among many other things. Andrew and I spoke via Skype from his home in Brooklyn, New York. You have an interesting background of how you got into the business. So let's talk about that first. Um, yeah, so I got my start... Um I grew up a guitar player and played in bands all growing up. And I was that kid in high school who had a PA system. And my dad was really supportive of my whole musical endeavor. And uh, I just kind of got really into like the theater scene at my high school. And I directed the talent show. And I, uh, I, yeah, I was just playing in bands and like around music all the time and sort of always had like an affinity for figuring out sounds and tones and mixing and lighting and all, all this kind of stuff. And uh, I kind of it was kind of a hobby for a long time. And then by the end of college, uh, I went to Syracuse University. I had met a band called Ra Ra Riot, who uh, I ended up touring with mixing Front of House. And that was kind of my first foot in the door in terms of like doing music professionally. And uh, yeah, so I toured for about five years, learning live sound and uh, traveling the country and part of the world. And along the way, I, I met a ton of bands and managers and musicians and started doing remixes and bought some recording gear, started doing EPs and mixing albums. And I, I don't know, it just kind of all happened as like a, a storm over the course of five years. And eventually I settled into doing producing and mixing more full-time. Well, it's pretty interesting that you actually went from front of house to the studio because that's not an easy jump at all. No, uh, I've always said though that they, the studio and live inform each other in amazing ways. And I always encourage studio people to try and do live sound if they can, because I think, I think you can learn a lot from it. Um, I, I certainly feel like it kicks your ass in terms of learning how to balance a mix like kind of the most important thing, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's problem solving above all else. And, um, yeah, I feel like if you can put together a live mix in, you know, sometimes it, it you have to do it in five minutes at a sound check. Uh, that, that gives you a, a pretty usable skill in the studio. And, uh, it also is inspiring because you can really have a control over the way the room feels at a show. And, there's something empowering about playing with the master fader. <laughs> you know, the chorus hits and you, you ramp it up 4 dB. That's a lot in a venue. And um, I don't know, I feel like that it kind of has encouraged me to take risks uh, while mixing records as well. Okay, let me ask you about the use of subwoofers or the overuse of subwoofers, I should say, because sometimes I just find them so overwhelming that it seems like there's so much concentration on the low end that people kind of forget the most important stuff, like vocals. So <laughs> where do you come down yeah. on that? <laughs> well, I think in a venue, they are incredible. Um, 
and, but there's nothing quite like a venue anywhere else, um, except maybe someone with a really killer listening room or monitoring environment at a studio. But in the studio, I hate subwoofers. At least I have thus far. There may come a day where I decide to integrate one into my monitoring, but I find myself just getting really distracted by if it's set up correctly, if I'm hearing the right amount of it. And I just kind of stop paying attention to what the work is. And uh, for that reason, I, I just I cut them out of the studio and I, I try and just learn the low end of my monitors. But I think in the venue, it's uh, it's the difference between it being like pretty cool or like amazing. And uh, so, yeah, I think playing with subs in, in a venue is a totally different kind of tr- uh, skill set. I have a really good friend who's been doing both live and studio for a long time. Dennis Moody. Dennis is the, I would say he's kind of like the preferred engineer for a lot of really high-end drummers like Steve Gadd and, you know, guys like that. But he also goes out in the road and he mixes 20,000 seaters. And the first thing he'll do, he'll go in and they'll say, okay, take the subs down 50%. <laughs> yeah. Most venues have them cranked way too hot. Yeah. Well, okay. So let's talk about you in the studio then. You mentioned about your monitors. What are you using? So I'm kind of a freak for like having as many around me as possible. <laughs> At the moment, this may change. I, I actually have one monitor controller daisy chained into another one uh, so that I have more outputs on my system. Uh, it seems that, you know, most of the the monitor controllers have like three, maybe four outputs, but I like to try and get six or seven going if possible. Wow. But I have a, a pair of ATC 25s um, and some Atom A7s. I've got NS10s. I've got Aventone Mix Cubes. And then I've got some KRK Rocket 8s that are kind of just like, I don't know, utility extra speakers to have around the studio and also like a little passive, you know, kind of cheap grade... Uh, home stereo pair. So I don't know, I kind of try and listen to everything I, I can and I just love making the rounds on different monitors and hearing what each has to offer. Do you get confused though? I mean, that's always been the disadvantage that people have said about having lots of monitors is that you, after a while you go, oh, I'm not sure what I should be trusting here. Yeah. I Well, I do stick to my kind of main three sets for the most part, the NS10s, the ATCs, and the Atoms. Um, but I don't know, I've had them for years, and I feel like I know those three really well, and I know what to expect from each of them. And so I don't need the other monitors, but it's really fascinating how sometimes I get these little hints from other speakers about what what could be better, and uh, sometimes those clues add up to making a mix, you know, just the tiniest bit more compelling. Um, it can be confusing, but and it's, sometimes I ignore those extra speakers, you know. Yeah, but yeah. every now and then. Have yeah. you heard the Amphions yet? No, I'm dying to. I, I really would like to, in the context of my studio, I've heard them at other people's studios, and they're incredible. But, you know, you go into someone else's room, and there's just a little bit too much new information happening to like really know what you think about something i just tracked Um, an album on them and uh, on the 218s and i gotta tell you they were great after the first hour i was a convert wow that's what everyone says yeah there's just some depth to them there's some truth to them they don't overhype like genlex or or some of the others or sound too good you know that's always been the claim of some that they just sound too good so you don't work hard enough these were just honest, but in a good way. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. You might want to check them out at some point. So when you're mixing, are you mixing in the box? These days, almost entirely, yeah. I, I kind of like the beginning of my arc as a mixer was all in Logic. And I did that for a couple of years. And then I got to a point where I could afford some nicer converters and, you know, kind of went into the outboard summing lane and... um I did that for a bunch of years, but within the past year and a half, I've kind of switched completely to in the box. And I feel like there's this thing happening right now where all the mixers are like convincing each other that it's okay. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And I I think they're right. You know, I love how Chad Blake puts it. Um, 
he's just like, we've been making records forever on tape. Like, let's do something different. Uh, you know, everyone, everyone gets drawn romantically to consoles and tape and there's time and place for that. But yeah, let's, let's do something new. There's a whole new kind of way of thinking when you mix with plugins that you couldn't do before. And uh, I'm just not convinced really that the Sonics are different enough uh, out of the box versus in the box to, to make or break what you're doing, you know? They're a little different, but I'd rather have the convenience. And I make use of that convenience. Yeah, especially if you have to go back and do recalls because boy, oh, yeah. doing it on a console, that, I mean, that's the thing that everybody used to hate doing it, which is why there are so many mixed versions at one point in time. It's like, I do not want to come back and have to do a recall no matter what. Yeah. Well, we're definitely on the other end of the pendulum swinging with that because <laughs> it's pretty common now that mixes I work on go, you know, at least to version five, six, or seven. But every now and then you get one where the artist is really particular and it's like 15, 16 touch-ups, you know? And, and by the end, it's just nuance. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a fine line because, you know, I consider that kind of attention to detail and like willingness to keep working on something as like good service, good customer service. But there kind of does come a point where maybe you're working backwards. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really trying to learn the psychology of mixing in the box and like how to how to keep it in check because it is easy to just overwork something if, when you can recall perfectly every time how fast are your mixes do you mix like one song all the way through or do you do multiple projects at the same time or how do you do that i definitely work on multiple projects by different artists uh at once but i tend to try to like um be regimented enough to work on one song all the way through and get it to a point where it feels presentable as mix one. Uh, and I tend to pull that off in about four hours. But every now and then I work on something where like, I just feel like, man, I don't, I'm not really hitting the mark right now. Like I should probably come back tomorrow and see if I can get it there before sending it to anybody. I, I, I've become really like into the idea of making sure that the first mix I send is is impressing me at least, you know, because there's just no there's no time for excuses or caveats or you gotta you gotta just get the first impression right. Yeah, I hear that from almost everybody, and and I feel the same way that boy, you better get that first one pretty much in the ballpark, <laughs> or else it's going to be yeah. a hard time if you don't. Or they might hire someone else, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you have a template that you always start from? Yeah, so. Like I mentioned before, I, I kind of started doing all this in Logic, and it's only with been uh, within the past year that I've ventured more into Pro Tools. I have a very, very, very elaborate Logic template that has been refining over the years, but I find it doesn't quite translate to Pro Tools the same way because of just the way VCAs work and soloing architecture works in Pro Tools. Uh, it doesn't quite translate, so I'm, I'm kind of trying to wrap my head around a new template for Pro Tools right now. But yeah, I love I love the concept of templates and I think it speeds everything up. And if you do it right, it can generate even more creativity. Now, that being said, are your templates like, I always have the guitar going through these particular plugins and I even know what the EQ might be like. And is it something like that or is it less sophisticated? It's somewhere in between. For me, it's the routing that, and, and having effect sends ready to go that that's kind of the most important piece of the puzzle for a template with me um i definitely load up some plugins but i don't necessarily have them on by default uh so it's kind of like i'll have a few things on my drum bus and maybe a couple like ssl channels on guitar buses and definitely some master bus things that are ready to pop in but it's kind of like a a palette more than it is a uh like preset chains, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds yeah. like you use a lot of buses. I do. Sometimes I wonder if I have too many going on because like <laughs> sometimes it gets a little confusing, uh, but that's sort of a matter of like having the mental focus to really keep track of what you've done. Um, and sometimes having that many buses makes revisions like a piece of cake because you have so many places that you can play with gain structure in um, really precise ways. And... 
so yeah, it's a, it's a balancing act of like having too many signal paths and more than uh, your standard just routing everything to the stereo bus uh, that allows you to, to do some really creative problem solving and ex- exciting moments. Does that mean you do a lot of processing on your buses? Depends. Uh, yeah, sometimes I kind of load up the buses with plugins and I mix into those chains. And other times I choose to kind of mix more at the source tracks and the buses are more clean. Um, it's different every time. And I, I think part of that is just I keep myself entertained with <laughs> <laughs> different workflows. And it's like, you know, if you can master doing a, a, a skill set like a couple different ways, yeah, they sort of start to inform each other and you just get better over time if, if, if you challenge yourself a bit, you know? Do you have a set of effects that you always start with? Yeah, I do like... This might be overkill, but I do, I max out the, uh, the sends, you know, whether it's eight in logic or 10 in pro tools and have like a room verb, a spring verb, a hall, a plate, a slap, an echo, a trail verb, like all these different things. And yeah, so it makes it really easy to send any track to any combination of that stuff. And, And I separate vocal effects from instrument effects from drum effects. So like everything's pretty, pretty elaborately separated. Um, But every now and then it's fun to do a mix where you just pick three effects and you you keep it very kind of uniform, you know? So given that you have this approach to mixing, that's definitely you. Did you have a mentor that maybe guided you in a direction or is this just something that came about over time? I've had kind of loosely two mentors or, or people that I really feel like I learned a ton from one of which was uh, Chris Walla the uh, he, he played guitar in Death Cab for Cutie for years and is an amazing producer and mixer he uh, I met him early on in my path and I learned a ton about recording and just kind of like studio process from him um, and then I did a mix with the masters seminar in 2010 with Michael Brower which which was the second ever session in that seminar. And uh, it kind of blew my mind. So obviously Michael is the king of <laughs> parallel routing and, you know, really cr- creative uh, signal flow technique. Uh, so he definitely got my brain turning on how to do some of this stuff. But, you know, he comes from a... or At the time, he was coming strictly from a console environment and... I kind of took his premise and ran with it, you know, even in more more depth with the digital flow. Um, but it seems like everyone's starting to move away from the console and get clever these days. Yeah, that's for sure. Again, I think it all comes down to recalls. No one wants to wait anymore for a recall. Yeah. There's just something really kind of, there's a lot of peace of mind in knowing that it's the same like even if you did have some system where you had an incredible console and assistance and endless time, you know, you, you're always battling that thing. Like, is it the same? It never <laughs> it's is. It's kind of nice to open it up. And uh, yeah, I just, I don't come from that generation. I, I'll be honest with you. I've never mixed a song that released on a console. I just have never done it. And I don't think I'll, I ever will. <laughs> so much of that is overrated. The tape thing is overrated for me. You know, I mention this often. You know, I never really liked the sound of tape. Interesting. In that it didn't sound the same. I liked what I heard on the console. It goes into tape and comes back sounding different. It's like, well, why would I want that? (laughs) Yeah, I think I remember Bob Clearmountain saying that uh, when asked about Apogee converters. uh, Yeah, he had the same reaction. He was like, I never, uh, it always sounded so good right off the console. Like, why can't we just use that? The other thing was console automation, which I've always hated. Mm. It took so long and a lot of time, especially in the early days, it wasn't really reliable either. And now it's just so easy to draw something in if you want it. I mean, it's so much more easier than it ever was to me on a console. So it's like, why bother going back there? Yeah, you have to futz with it less, I think, to make it sound big and fat like everybody wants, but you can do it in the box too. Yeah, I think there's a lot to learn from working on analog equipment. Um, Like even if it's just like a Neve style preamp and hearing what a, you know, kind of a kit, like a close to the kit mic sounds like when you blow it up on a Neve, like you can learn a lot from 
analog circuitry and and then sort of store that sound in your brain and be like, how do I how do I get that in the digital? Um, and we might be past the point of that being a <laughs> useful exercise because now everything just sounds so incredible in these plugins and and they're all starting to become a little bit more geared towards being distortion and saturation oriented and there's stuff happening under the hood of dials that you don't know what's going on and yeah it's just, we're spoiled now we have some pretty cool pretty cool tools out there yeah no one complains about plugins anymore about them not sounding yeah. like the real thing or whatever and you know again everybody kind of went well maybe it isn't like the real thing but it's 95 percent of the way there that's good enough <laughs> yeah and then, and then you're just talking like the difference of medium i mean you know, the, the, this always comes up, but the, there's tests done that say kids prefer the sound of MP3s. Like, it's 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 kind of true with digital mixing now. I think the, the top end, the, the forwardness, it's specific to digital. Andrew, do you have favorite plugins that you find you use all the time? Definitely, uh, I have a lot of stuff, but it's it's kind of the the standard fare. I've got all the UAD stuff, which is incredible. Um, I've got the sound toy stuff and waves and fab filter and that's kind of the core of it. And then there's, you know, these really cool things that pop up like, uh, you heard this plugin Soothe by Oak Sound? Yes. It's freaking crazy. It's like, I mean, that's like a dream come true kind of tool, you know, like fixing resonance with very little effort and it's dynamic. Uh, that's an amazing plugin. So it's really exciting when new things like that come out. But I feel like we got the bases covered with, you know, the, the companies I just listed. Are there certain plugins that you know you're always going to use in certain places? Yeah. Um, again, I try and challenge myself to use different things sometimes just to see if I like it. And I feel like, you know, ultimately your ears and your judgment and your experience will, will dictate what's working and what stays. But uh yeah, I mean, I use Decapitator like crazy. Everything from a distortion effect to a way to get excitement out of the mid-range just ever so slightly. Um, I use the Waves API 2500 on the drum bus sometimes as a means to clip the drums because if you pop in the uh, manual output mode and turn up that red volume knob, you get, when the, when the plugin's in analog mode, you get this cool soft clipping that in combination with the, the 2500 kind of smack sound, uh, I love that on my drum bus. I use it maybe half the time. Mm -hmm. um, things like that, yeah. I'll always, always reach for the tools that I know what the result will be if it's like a kind of a problem-solving thing. But if I feel like getting inspired, um, I might try a plugin I've never used before or, or string together two plugins that I've never strung together. Hmm. It's just amazing what you can do. It's so fun. <laughs> what do you find the most difficult thing to do when you're mixing? More recently, I've had, I've had some work that's a little bit more in the pop lane, and I notice that people are really particular about their rough mixes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think something that I'm, I'm working on that's probably a, a good skill to have uh, is, is bridging the gap between the rough mix and you know, what you would consider to be like a more realized, exciting, compelling version of the song. And uh, sort of threading that needle can be really hard. And sometimes I spend as much time trying to meet those two sensibilities as I do just building the mix uh, and getting things kind of in order. So yeah, there's sort of the, this like, this it's sort of like psychological warfare too. It's like, how much do they love this rough mix? How much do I need to match it? Uh, should I go out on a limb and try something a little different with the low end? Should I, should I make the snare louder? You know, all these questions pop in your mind and you run in circles a bit. At least I find myself doing that. But in the end, you, you get to a place where you're A, being the rough and the, your, your current mix and you get this feeling where like, I'm definitely beating it. And that's, that's the point at which you kind of say like, all right, I think we're ready to send mix yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hardly ever listen to the rough. Really? Yes. And the whole idea is if they want me to mix something, they want my tastes. And yep. if I listen to what's been done before, I'll be too influenced by it. The, the exception would be if somebody says, 
I need the sound of whatever, you know, that guitar sound has to sound like that. Well, then you're Mm -hmm. kind of forced to listen to it to find out what that is. Yeah. You know, it's kind of worked for me so far. There's one or two times where somebody said, nah, you know, you you have to get closer (laughs) to the rough, but most of the time not. Yeah, I find that that was like, that was a kind of a recurring theme. And that might've just been the luck of the draw with the particular songs and artists I was working on, you know, leading up to my answer for you here. But yeah, it's sort of disappointing when you you go out on a limb and you try something and they it's just like the first comment is like, yeah, no. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> put it put it back. So, you know, it happens a couple times and 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 you 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 feel inclined to stick to the rough a bit. But uh I think that ideally what happens over time is yeah, you, your credits and your taste and your skill and your results start to speak for themselves and then pe- people hire you for that reason and and uh, I don't know. I think I think there's a way to just kind of average all these topics and and just get yourself in a position where you're really good. And and I'm working on that. And uh, we all are, you know. Yeah, yeah. What's the most fun thing for you to do? I would have to say probably probably doing mix number one. I think is 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 my favorite part of mixing, where where you have that freedom to explore, and uh, it's it's like it's the funniest thing from. From mix two on, it feels like work, you know. Yeah. Because you're 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 sort of dealing with mix notes and integrating other people's opinions, and, and you're you're threading a needle, and you're 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 playing with a house of cards. Uh, but mix one is great. I love it, and I also really like producing bands that I love, which you know it, it is not the bulk of my work right now. Um, but when something comes along, where I can feel invested enough to produce it uh it's it's just like the most rewarding thing to build up songs at, on the production level and then eventually getting into mixing when you're producing do you have a specific approach because everybody has a different way of doing it especially in the early times before you get to the studio is there an approach that you found that has worked i know what you mean like there's there's like different kind of uh there's different like schools of thought as to what a producer even is, you know. Yeah. I think I think I come from it more, a little bit more from the engineering side and like a, a soundscape side. I think it's really fun to plug a bunch of stuff in, pedals and wacky signal paths, and and just sort of let chance and like randomness dictate inspiring sounds, and, and sort of let that be the springboard for my process. Um, and I'm I'm getting more and more into like you know, how arrangement and and songwriting influences the producing. But yeah, in the past, I think a lot of the projects I've done that people have been excited about or or I've been really proud of have been sort of having sonic imprints that are really exciting or or slightly strange or um, that kind of thing. And then just, you know, creating a a fun environment and like keeping it light. Uh, I, I tend to work in my own studio, which are have been rooms that I've rented over the past couple of years in New York uh, in Brooklyn. And I kind of just make my own little weird world with all my gear. And sometimes we use other studios, you know, more pro studios and we're tracking live drums that need to sound really crisp or something. But yeah, I don't know. I think it's just uh, my own arsenal of toys and sort of a uh, sound hunting that informs producing right now for me. Last question, Andrew, what is the, best piece of business advice that you either learned along the way or maybe somebody imparted to you? Yeah. Let's see. Well, two things come to mind. Uh, First of all, I should say I'm I'm not really the most business-minded kind of person, um, but I have a huge respect for people that that really do get that. And I've been extremely lucky to have had a manager for most of my run here. And I I met my manager relatively early in my path, and uh, he's just been so invaluable to my growth and my opportunities. So I know, I know it's, it's a little like forward to just be like, well, just get a manager. But I, even if it's someone who can speak on your behalf, uh, to have a phone call with someone about money for you, uh, it, it just seems like it's such an easy thing to separate if possible, just delegate those money conversations to someone else. And, and, and that way you don't have to be the bad guy with the artist about money ever. So yeah, I think it's, uh, if, if you're not comfortable with talking about business 
try and find someone to help you with that. And that, that's that been my scenario. And then the other thing that come that came to mind is just, I don't know if this is necessarily business advice, but I think it was something that really stuck with me about working in the music industry. Uh, someone once told me that the music industry is as social as it is professional or, you know, skill oriented. And it's just amazing how like you can open opportunities for yourself if you're just socially like on the same page with the people you want to work with. And I think it's just important to be a cool person and like try and just uh, have a connection with people that you want to work with and try and foster that as much as you foster anything else in your skill set. You can find out more about Andrew at andrewmori.net. That's spelled Andrew, A-N-D-R-E-W, Mori, M-A-U-R-Y, all one word, andrewmori.net. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyowinnercircle.com, or you can find it in iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, and Google Play. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyowinnercircle.com, you'll also find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts to new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. 